Hello again, this is Ryan with Better Tattooing and viewer requests, let's do a deep dive on what exactly melanin is. All right. With melanin, melanin, melanin. What, is, what the heck is melanin? Well, we know what it is, kind of, right? Because that's what gives skin its color, or eyes its color, or hair. It's, it's something that's just gonna denote some tone or, or something that we can identify visually, right? Uh, person to person, it's gonna have a little bit of difference. Now, this stuff is all based on your ancestry, your genetic profile, and it's gonna have different uh, expressions out there. So um, while we can't cover every type of melanin because there's still some being discovered, and oh my gosh, there are so many of them, we're just gonna go over the basic function of what melanin is, what it does, uh, and how it actually applies to tattooing, but a little bit more focused than just like, uh, you know? Okay, so. Root again, we've talked about this a few times, right? Melanin is the small little globules of pigment They're located in the epidermis, right? That top protective layer of skin. They're actually at the very bottom of it. And uh, they help protect the body from, I've got another marker here, damaging rays of light, which is just energy, right? Um, there's a few different types of melanin. We have eumelanin, right, which is going to be the most commonly seen one, uh, or at least easily identifiable, that uh, we can see out there. And that's uh, also known as black brown melanin. I guess I should write up what type that is. It's eumelanin, it's EU, right? Melanin. Uh, EU, U is actually Greek, it means. True, so like the true melanin, right? And then we also have the pheo melanin, that's P-H-E-O, melanin. And this one is uh, more commonly seen uh, as, as uh, expressing red or yellowing effects um, when it's interacting with energy, right? Uh, you see somebody who has red hair, they usually have more pheo melanin than you'll actually see with the eumelanin, especially on like their hair follicles and such. And uh, it ends up reflecting, right? Those types of uh, light waves of visible light uh, shifted off the spectrum to produce reddish, yellowish tints, right? So even blonde hair and stuff has that. These people with black or brown hair, they usually have higher concentrations of eumelanin in there, as well as when things start to turn gray, you're gonna see concentrations of these pushing out very specific tints and tones, right? So <laughs> hopefully this isn't gonna be moving a little bit too quickly, but, um, I took some notes while we were doing this so I can make sure I actually stay on track. So if you see me bending over like this, um, just ignore me. I uh, don't have a stand for my uh, tablet where I took my notes. Um, so melanin is manufactured inside of our skin by these really cool organelles. I'm gonna draw these out a little bit. Uh, called melanocytes, right? Uh, Milano, oh geez, I might as well have sites. Site, cell, right? And uh, the melanin that is produced inside there is stored inside the melanosomes, an organelle where it's actually just kind of like stuck into. And they keep these globules of pigment called melanin. Now what happens is the melanosomes end up kind of parking themselves through this like really weird dendritic uh, uh, process where it's like almost like octopus tentacles that crawl along. Um, and they end up dropping these, well the melanocytes do, let's store it in the melanosomes where the melanin is, um, around the nucleus whoop, 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 of a keratinized cell. And what it does is the actual melanin inside of it will unravel and it ends up wrapping around the nucleus of the cell and it ends up protecting that structure from incoming rays of energy, UVA, UVB, whatever, absorbing it, making sure that stuff can't pass through and damage the DNA that's in there. It's really cool, right? The greater amount of melanin that you have, the darker that your skin is, and that also means the more protection that you have from these damaging rays. Now, 
it's kind of interesting, right? Because melanin doesn't just stay deposited in the top layer of the skin in the epidermis. It actually creeps down to can stain other keratinized cells underneath it. And when that happens, you end up having deeper, more dark tinted skin as well, right? It's not just gonna be a whole ton of glottal, I mean, there's a ton of it anyways, but it's not just gonna be relegated to a single space. Um, melanin has immunological functions on that side of itself to save and protect and trigger and signal and do other things. But we're not gonna get into that because that's some really, really heavy stuff. Um, but it's, it's absolutely key to have this stuff. I mean, it's even in your brain for heaven's sakes, right? It is there as a protective force to stop damage and to let the body know when things are happening that it needs to be on alert, right? That's gonna be the first line of defense. It's kind of like that, that forward FOB, right? Where you've got something that's coming at you and you can signal back to the things behind it to come and bring support. So. This is fun, right? <laughs> Out of the two types of the melanin that we got here again, let me erase that. The eumelanin's black brown potential on side of it, it means that it's showing how strongly it can absorb visible energy or invisible energy that's coming in touch with it, right? Black, as we know, is gonna be an absorption of any type of light or energy that's, that's hitting it, right? Which is why things appear dark. Like if you're standing in a tunnel looking out towards the light space always appears like it's really closer than it is you can end up walking for you know an hour and be like oh now we're finally at the end right but if you're going to be standing outside of a tunnel looking in you can never tell how deep it goes right because there's an absence of light that's there it's really good at being absorbed just because it is what it is right and so we're going to see these two types absorbing a whole lot more than what's there. So like when you get a tan, the amount of energy that's gonna be able to pass through the skin, if you tan, right, is going to decrease. What do we mean by that? Let's do a little illustration here. If we've got our sun, and our sun is shining rays, and it comes in contact with melanin, the melanin will actually decrease, let's just do a whole bunch of rays, the amount of energy that's gonna be able to pass through, because some of it will end up getting caught and trapped and triggered into it. So only certain things will be able to make it through, especially when you're dealing with black or brown, right? It's gonna be absorbing a massive amount of energy across the visible and invisible light spectrum. Um, when we start moving down to the browns, we're gonna have a decrease in certain parts of those wavelengths that are gonna be expressed in the visible light spectrum as well, right? Where you're gonna have that tinting and undertones of skin that's gonna be more apparent. So if you have very, very, very dark skin, the chances of you having a visible undertone that can be expressed easily and identified visibly by having some brown in there is gonna decrease as well because there's just not enough light energy actually reaching those parts of your skin for us to make a visible identification, especially at a distance. Now, when you start decreasing the total amount of like eumelanin that's going to express across that specific wavelength, we're gonna be able to allow in certain wavelengths of light that are easier to see. So instead of just having straight up bombardment of all white, right, available frequencies of light, if we decide to take a prism and break it up, metaphorically, right? And we have a whole bunch of different color bands coming through, which is realistically what's happening. Uh, and coming into contact, do you have a green here? Oh, heck yeah, I do. Nice. And a blue. If we have all these trying to come in and pass, only a certain type are actually gonna be able to make it through, right? And that's gonna be when we look at our visible light spectrum trapped inside our radiation wavelength guide that we've got here, right? With ultraviolet on one side and infrared on the other. If you have an allowance of a certain amount of wavelength or certain speed of light that's gonna be coming through, it may only knock out certain aspects of one. Maybe it partially knocks out some purple, even less of green, but it'll be able to allow through, oh, so we'll even do this one, a whole bunch of the blue, some of the warmer, right, warmer tones that we see, like maybe reds, oranges, yellows, you're gonna get a different variance in the underlying tissues where we can see tone, right? And that's also gonna influence how we see colors through that tone. So that's eumelanin. When we get into pheomelanin, things get a little bit different, right? Now, while eumelanin is usually gonna be found in the highest concentrations of people who are gonna be living or have come ancestrally from around the equator, eumelanin is usually gonna be coming from those further north, right? And it's kind of weird because if we're gonna go even further, further north and we start seeing people who are defined ancestrally, you know, uh, at the poles, 
this doesn't really fit. There's a temperate line that we're actually going to be trying to stick within because if you have people who have existed at the poles for a long time, there technically is a ton of sun and it also tends to reflect off the ground, which is really fun, right? So you're going to end up getting darker skinned people as well at those higher latitudes or lower, right? Um, and we start seeing people with like red hair, everyone kind of knows you're going to be like, oh, that's an Irish person. Yeah, right. So that's what we're thinking about is like along those lines uh, when we're looking at the planet where we have less daylight on average, right? We have more cloud cover, rainier conditions, maybe it's a temperate rainforest. There's just going to be more, more gray than bright. That doesn't mean that there isn't bright, of course, but just historically there would be less. Uh, the pheomelanin is going to be produced kind of the same way, right? But what it's going to do is it's only going to trap and reflect certain amounts of that visible spectrum. And it's going to be along those red yellow pathways, right? Where it's going to be leaning another way, a little bit further more towards one side of that, that light spectrum than the other. Um, when triggered by a response like energy coming in contact with the body, as it has some of these just naturally laying about, will start to produce more and more and more. With you, melanin, your skin gets darker as a tan. And when you are of very fair skin, you'll start to get not only a burn, but your skin will turn red. So you can still have a tan, an Irish tan is where your skin gets kind of a reddish hue to it, but not actually be burnt which is interesting, right? It's just that what we see with people who have higher concentrations of pheomelanin is that their skin tends to burn faster because it's absorbing less of the damaging rays allowing them through. Some of the things that you'll see as well is that, you know, people who don't produce melanin, right, uh, that have albinism, their body is just not producing it. It's, you know, it's either like an autoimmune um, issue where the body is like destroying the cells or even the melanin that's being produced, uh, they're not going to have any of the benefits of this stuff, right? It's going to just allow light at any frequency to come in, damage things that are going to come out and come back out. And they tend to burn really quickly. So even like saying like somebody's really fair skinned, like, oh, you know, you're from, you know, Sweden or something. Ah, oh, you're an albino. That's not actually how it is. Their body still does produce usually a lot of pheomelanin, which means that they're gonna get burnt, but it's not gonna be the same as somebody who suffers from albinism. It's like a genuine medical condition. So now that we know what melanin is with this stuff, go back and watch one of the other videos that we have about how to identify the colors, shapes, uh, you know, how, to, how to prep for dark skin, things like this, to try and understand how to better produce the tattoos that you're gonna have, right? And it should make it easier when you start thinking about not only like trauma responses or things like this, like how the design process before the tattoo is actually done. Okay. We don't need to touch on that again. Cause I think I beat that to your death with a stick. All right. We got a couple other things we can cover about this and we'll actually try to keep it a little bit more tattoo related because that's what we do. I need to check my notes. We're going to take a break for a sec. All right, we're back. <laughs> uh, so the next thing we need to do is try to talk about undertones of the skin, or at least being able to identify them, right? Because now we know what melanin does, uh, knowing how it affects the skin and being able to pull it out so that we can you know, identify how to create our designs a little bit better is kind of key, right? So we're gonna turn to the Fitzpatrick scale, which I think is really funny that there's you know, some Fitzy out there who came up with this stuff, which is fine. And we won't even say the joke, right? Anyways, um, so for Fitzpatrick scale, you can go ahead and look it up if you want to as well. I might put a link down in the uh, description about the uh, Wikipedia article that has it. But it has five different classifications for skin type and tone. It's pretty simple. It actually can be broken down further than this, but this is just kind of the, the overview, right? Um, and when we think about uh, concentrations of melanin, this is how things are going to be broken up into this system, right? So. Um, there also could be, and I don't know if this is actually included into it, a sliding scale of the more likely that you're going to see like pheomelanin production inside of a person uh, versus having just uh, eumelanin production as well. Um, which, I mean, we can make that assumption, but I haven't read anything about it, so I'm not going to jump to that conclusion. Anyways, um, usually like class one of this what we're going to see is this is burned easily, right? 
if you see somebody who has very fair skin and they go out in the sun and they just you know, less than five minutes they burn, they're usually gonna be classified as one. And you can go ahead and open up your phone right now if you're watching on it, or maybe you even just remember in the top of your head. Go and look at the emojis that you have on your phone. And they're gonna have five different classifications inside there, which, oh no, it's four now, isn't it? So they blended number one and two together, and you're gonna see the different types of skin tones that are actually apparent with this scale. Yay, it's even made it to tech. Right, uh, number two, is a minimal tan that you're gonna see, right? But usually tends to burn as well. Um, min burn, but, oh, sorry, min tan, but burn. <laughs> but burn. Um, these are gonna be people who say like, oh, after I get my initial, you know, bad burn, it settles in and it's not as bad after that, but they can still burn continually afterwards. That's usually going to be the classification of number two. Uh, classification three is going to be sometimes uh, burn, but easily tan, right? <clears throat> You're going to see this with usually people who already kind of have like an olive tone type of complexion, but it'll be on the lighter side of things. Um, and it's pretty easy to see, like you just ask people when you're doing a consultation, like, hey, do you burn easily if you go out in the sun? If they go, no, not really. Like I can be out, you know, for hours and it doesn't bother me. They, and they're relatively fair skin, they're usually gonna fall into classification three. So number four is rarely burns, right? And usually is always tanned. Oops, always tanned. Uh, if somebody is out in the sun, direct sunlight for a few hours and their skin doesn't burn and they usually look like they have medium tone skin, this is classification four. Five, of course, is never burns, right? Which is amazing because you have to have met somebody who has burnt before, right? No, this is really dark tone skin. They can be out in the sun nonstop and nothing is gonna to happen to them. So the Fitzpatrick scale is gonna come in handy when we're thinking about actually doing our application of the tattoos because this is also gonna be our size and placement guide, right? Detail-wise, as we're moving across this, people who are on the fairer side, you're gonna be able to put in more fine detail and be able to understand it at a distance than somebody who has never able to burn, right? We're gonna have a scale where we want to continually up the size of what we're going to see, either in thickness dropping detail or just making it larger, right? So make sure that the tattoo is actually gonna be easier to identify at a distance. Um, if we take something that is extremely fine and we put it into somebody who has extremely dark skin, there's not going to be enough light energy that's gonna be able to penetrate that skin to actually interact with it. So we have our scale of fives, right? And all we're gonna do with this is we're gonna have our multiplier of size on top of this, right? Five is base, moving down. We're gonna have it base size, you know, five rounds. You can go with a 10 and you know that it's gonna be seen at a big distance. And you can start scaling up, right, with how much detail you can put in in that space. Um, at the same time, when I was taught, what we would do is we would say, this is going to be the size of Sharpie markers that you can get right? You can have your ultra fine versus your chisel tip. And when you apply those to the body, you're going to be able to see that at a distance. So that's just detail wise, right? For tones, what we're going to do is we're going to start reducing those total, um, like variable shades down bit by bit by bit, right? While with somebody who is extremely fair skin, you can put in just a ton of different gradations to try and make like a ton of depth. Somebody who has very dark tones and you can't, right? You're going to be set with, you know, and I mean, this is kind of all mixed up and stuff, but um, one sec. Okay, I just needed to think about how I was gonna phrase that. And I'm like, I don't want to just like have dead air. Maybe I'll just put in like one of those nasty chops that everyone does, where it's just like, when you like see the body jump. Uh, when we're thinking about our tones and shades, usually when we're gonna get this is, is going to be, we'll, we'll just use our name, same thing. I'm just making this up as we go along. We'll do our rule of fives, right? Where before we had the variations of size that's gonna be mixed up, with this one we're gonna to have to go, you know, a divisible side on this, right? 
where we have to start actually removing the total amount of tones that are there. Now, if you take like a graphite set and you go from your you know, 5H down to your 8B, inside of there, you're gonna be able to see a bunch of different tones, right? Somebody who is very, very fair, you can utilize all those different shades and it'll show up. Or somebody who is very dark, you can't, right? So you're gonna be mixed into usually single tone stuff for super dark stuff. Five over five, you're gonna have one thing that you're gonna know will work out. Any extra variations in there are probably gonna muddy it up. And you just start stepping it back, right? Knowing how many that you can. Simple, right? You can do one and a quarter tone. Cool. <laughs> that seemed to work out. Yeah, I'll just end up doing the cut there. All right. So now we got the Fitzpatrick done. We understand how melanin works. Man, this red never comes off. I also think I've used this whiteboard a bit too much, so that's always fun. The last thing we're gonna have to do is try to understand exactly what we're gonna do when we're actually tattooing, all right? So one more second, I'm gonna go check my notes and we'll come back to that. And we're back. So last one we're gonna talk about is on the application side with varying different shades and tones, excuse me, is identifying trauma. Now this is, it, it may seem like this is simple, right? And that we should all understand this, but it's commonly just skipped over mists. Like it, it does, it, we don't look at things equivalent when we're doing tattoos in the most part, right? What we're trying to do is make something on this paper or screen or whatever, right? Look like that in the skin. And when we're doing the application, what we're doing on average, or what we're thinking on average, is we're trying to just do that one-to-one -one replication, right? So if we have, you know, a block of skin that we're working on, and we're trying to do a line, where we're depositing that pigment is gonna be underneath, right? That melanized layer, we're gonna be putting it into like this spot of the body where there's not a lot of pigment. And we expect, especially when we work on light tone skin, that as soon as that trauma occurs and we're able to put that pigment in there, that we get an immediate feedback. We place it, we can see it, and that's that. Why? The lighter your skin tone is, the more energy can simply pass through and you're gonna get an immediate feedback on this. But what happens when the skin is darker? At times, and I've seen this a lot, especially at conventions and stuff, people will run a line, they'll deposit the pigment, and if they don't get that immediate hit where you can see it, they'll decide to go over it again and again and again and again and again. And when you do that, you keep running it or you're running it slower, you're running it faster, you run it deeper, you do these things, you end up traumatizing the skin massively. And you can think about it because you would never run that on a light skinned person. Why are you doing it to somebody with dark toned skin, right? So what happens is we end up running it a bunch of times until we've literally eviscerated the melanized layer and the redness and swelling and even blood slash exudate that is normally gonna occur with the trauma starts to dissipate. We'll see massive swelling. And then all of a sudden enough light is able to pass through and interact with the stuff there that we can see it. That is dangerous. Now, if you see people with dark toned skin, the, you, it's, you can usually touch the tattoo and feel topography, right? Like there is movement to it. You can run your hand over it and it's braille. Like you can feel it that is really heavy scarred tissue. And it usually occurs because of something like this. People have gone in, they've done a line, they've done it correctly, but they're not getting that feedback right when it happens. So they go, Whoa. and then they do it over and over and over and over and over. And it ends up destroying the skin. So, some things to know about. If you have darker toned skin and you're getting a tattoo or you're tattooing someone with darker toned skin, it can take anywhere from five to 10 minutes, right? To see, oops, we have got way too many there. We'll do that and then not about this, oh. Um, to actually see the effect of the tattoo come through. Now why? When you do something, expose the skin to trauma, you're gonna have a hit right where the skin is going to react. You're gonna get inflammation, you're gonna get swelling, you're gonna get redness, blood push in the area. And what happens when that occurs is the skin ends up, as it swells, it swells from the bottom up, right? We're gonna end up actually having a contraction of those cells that are containing melanin compressing together, which is going to increase that level of aggregation, which is going to decrease what? The amount of energy that can pass through. 
It'll block it and just absorb it. It'll just get stuck here. Even though there's pigment down there, you won't be able to see it. So how do we stop that? What do we do? We wait five to 10 minutes. Run your line, leave it, grab a cool cloth, no soap, right? When you're all done with all your line work, lay it on top of the skin and bring down some of the redness. Once you do that, you go back and you look at what's there. Because what you're doing at that point in time is allowing the skin to relax. And as it relaxes, you're gonna be able to see what your efforts are. Because now there's going to be a greater amount of energy going into the skin, interacting with the particles of pigment that are in there, right? And that's like key. If you do something like this and you're not getting that immediate hit back, just pause. Don't rush it, don't do anything, right? Just take your time. And when you do things like this and you allow the skin to actually relax, you decrease the chances of it like scarring, which is amazing. I mean, there's also some other stuff that goes into the aftercare after all of this trauma that occurs, which we really need to talk about. And there's another video, I might put it up in the clicky thing up here, which you can check about that, especially like the uh, trans epidermal water loss factors affecting the use of transparent adhesive bandages. I don't know if we did one on that or not, but anyways, in doing all this research, cause like I learned about skin and melanin, oh, years ago. So I was a little bit rusty this morning. I came up with a few hypotheticals which if anyone in the medical uh, community is out there and is listening, I would really like to know. I've been talking to some physicists today as, as well, trying to see uh, how melanin may, may actually work, right? Because like we know in normal, we'll get a little skin model here, in normal environmental uh, interactions, when, when light ends up hitting that melanized layer and it contains very strong UVA, UVB rays, and I actually have a feeling that there is gonna be some type of um, alternative input that maybe hasn't been identified yet that is also gonna stimulate the production of various types of melanin inside the body. Um, when that happens, it just replicates and we get more melanin, right? Now I'm wondering if anyone out there does know, and if you do, please let me know because this is driving me bonkers today. People who have darker toned skin tend to have a higher amount of cooling required because the melanin inside their body is absorbing a ton of heat, right? So what happens is it tends to sweat, sweats, and it's not like, oh, I'm pooling sweat. It's called transepidermal water loss factors, right? Where the body is expressing more moisture to try and cool it off, right? Now, I've always wanted to know since this morning to make it dramatic, if, the expression of additional humidity around the outside of the skin is gonna cause an issue with the refractory ability of light that's coming in, which is either going to scatter the light or if it's gonna amplify the light that's there to increase the actual amount of melanin production that you're gonna get. That would be really cool to know. Cause I mean, if it does have a scattering effect, then we're gonna see people who are of lighter toned skin maybe not having that ability. Maybe there is, you know, not just the sweating or maybe the skin starts to express more. Maybe there's like an actual gradient that we can, ex that we can, that we can see through testing that as you burn, maybe you burn slower as your skin adapts. Oh, that'd be super duper cool. Anyways, that's some heavy stuff. Uh, <laughs> last thing I wanna to touch on for today is going to be timing, all right? Now, every time that we do a tattoo, we've got to think about when it's going to look its best, all right? Uh, we'll do this. There's gonna be broken up into four months. I mean, depending on where you live, like if, you, if you're in New England, it's like, we got seasons. Yeah, I know. But out in the West Coast, we got two, right? We got spring and winter. Um, when people are outside in their environment, they're going to be exposed to the elements and their skin is going to be of different tone through the year, depending on the amount of melanin that they have, right? So usually in the winter, we're gonna have like, you know, one value which we'll say is just neutral with limited amount of exposure to the elements, depending on where you live, of course, right? Uh, while in the summer, we're gonna have if you're especially an outdoorsy person, I know they're gonna be like, I only play video games and I never leave the house. I understand. Uh, but for anyone who is out in the elements and, and you know, 
uh, exposing their body to various forms of stresses and stimuli. That's usually when your skin is going to be its darkest. Whether you initially burn and tan afterwards, you always burn, you wear SPF, you know, 10 million, whatever, the, the skin is going to be at its most engaged with its environment in comparison with the winter where we you know may wear coats or be covered up you know and try to stay out of the elements um, in the spring and fall as well we're going to see a decrease right as this is ramping up we're going to see a five plus and we're going to see this ramping down as it starts getting darker and cooler and we start covering up more right when we start thinking about how we're going to be placing the tattoo, we've got to think about when we're doing it and what time of the year it is, right? If somebody has dark toned skin and they tan, right, on a class four, maybe leaning on towards the class five, we have to plan what the tattoo is going to look like at the darkest. Same with the people who tan easily, like a type three, right? We want to make sure that we're going to have a design that is going to look good regardless of the time of year. If you are doing a tattoo in the winter and something comes up and is super vibrant by the time that someone tans in the summer, it may not look good at all. So think about that when you're going into your actual design process, whether you're a client trying to get a tattoo or you're somebody doing it that should be one of the first things that you're thinking about to make sure that you can enjoy it year round, right? As well as when you're getting it done. Now, depending on the climate that you're in, especially with extreme climates, the summer and the winter may be not the best time to get your tattoo. In the frozen Arctic tundra, in the winter, you've got great insulation, great clothes, things weren't over top of it, it's not gonna be exposed to the elements a lot, but you get a sweat underneath those clothes. Is that gonna be okay given what your profession is, right? At the same time in the summer, in the desert, maybe not a good time to get a tattoo. It might be a little bit crispy. Because remember, when we do a tattoo, we're damaging the protective layer of skin on top. You can pick up a sunburn exponentially faster on a tattoo than on unbroken skin. And you can get frostbite on a tattoo much, much, much faster than on the skin next to it that does not have a wound, right? So. That's our talk from Melanin today. Thank you for joining me. If you like this, let me know. We can do more science stuff. Mm. Um, which we always do science, don't we? Hey. Uh, like, subscribe, leave comments, do any of that stuff. I don't know. Uh, go check out our swag shop. We've got a new uh, design coming up that's a polar bear. It looks chill. And uh, <laughs> uh, if you want to as well support the show, leave us a coffee thingy in the link. Anyways, thank you so much for watching this. Ryan from Better Tattooing, signing off. Hey, hey, hey.